What's up, Tucker? Glad What's to going have you on, on Justin? Show. Thank yeah. you for having me. Yeah, this is fun. So we've talked about this for a little while. We run in a, a handful of similar circles with Front Row Dads and with uh, Dripping Springs, the community out there. And mm -hmm. um, for those that are unaware, there's this incredible community just out uh, west of Austin and uh, just with some amazing people, a lot of friends that are, you know, kind of uh, learning how to ranch and learning how to you know grow gardens and have cattle and do all this cool stuff that you have embarked on in this new season of life and so i'm excited to talk about that i'm excited to talk about uh your entrepreneurial life but uh more than anything it's just good to have you on the show thank you man thanks for having me so um i'm curious what what is life like for you right now this is a different season yeah. i feel like than you've ever experienced since yep. i've known you and then since ever, maybe since I when I was uh, growing up, my grandmother had a beef cattle ranch in Kentucky, like a big one, like 500 head. And so like I, kind, I didn't live on it, but I was out there a lot. And so um, I think she sold it when I was 12. And so right about 40 or 35 years <laughs> it took me to come back. And, and I have, you know, way less uh, uh, livestock than her and way less land. But yeah, it's it's. Uh, I sold my company, um, uh, and we've been out here almost two years now. Um, and dude, my life right now is because my wife's scaling her company, and so like, and I sold mine. And I haven't really started my next thing, and so my time is fam, like kids. Like I'm basically, yeah, I take the kids to school, I pick them up. I'm kind of uh, um, uh, mainly responsible for them, and then. Um, the ranch dude the homes it's really more of a homestead because we only have like two cows and like 35 or so 40 sheep and like 40 chickens um and so like and we garden like you said and, and growing all that stuff and so like my job is that dude like today before the podcast uh, i put in a, a work pen for the sheep you know like a, you get like a head with a head gate so you can you know whatever um do what you have, foot trim or whatever you need to do and then I uh, I put up uh, I, I cut some wood, some trees were, like went down the other day, and I uh, did some fence post stuff. Like it was like <laughs> it was like basically manual labor all day, <laughs> all wow. day. I know, right? And it's Times so have funny, changed. dude. I like if this was my job, I would put a bullet in my brain. I would hate it. <laughs> like if it was like if I was getting paid for this, nothing against it, just me personally. Yep. If I had to wake up every day and go do manual labor, I would hate it. But I actually like it because it's like this is my ranch or my homestead, my family's homestead, and like my kids love this place and everything we do that makes it better, it's like it's yours, right? And not like, you know, your company is yours or whatever, but this isn't mine in an abstract sense. Like right. this is, those trees are tangible. mine. tangible. Yeah. Right, and those sheep are mine. And like what it looks like and ha what the soil is and how much water we have and what the grass is like this is all like there's no HOA that handles this <laughs> like there's nobody <laughs> else either so it's like I'm either gonna have a really crappy homestead or I'm gonna have a really nice homestead and it's basically completely on me Tucker you know? is the HOA so uh <laughs> right right I don't do good the well, last little, I lived you know Barton Creek right in just some big big mansion and there was an HOA and I can't tell you how many times I get the HOA letters and I would just throw them away and they'd come, hey, you know, okay, they were very passive aggressive. It's like, get the fuck out of here. Like, it didn't work. <laughs> I was not, I'm not, I don't deal well with busybodies telling me what to do. It's not good. Yeah, I, I don't feel like you do well with anyone <laughs> no. letting you know what they think you should do. <laughs> no. Well, telling me what you think I should do, fine. Telling me what I have to do. Right. That's different. Now, how many acres do you have? Because you, you bought a massive property. Yeah, I mean it's big, it's big for out here. It's not that much for te we're in Texas, right? So I I think it's forty five acres, uh, forty five and a half, something like that. Um, it's not really that much for Texas, but it's you know it's it's for one man working without grown kids, right? It's it's a hand. It's it's yeah, about you got young kids. Yeah, I my kid like nine is the oldest, right? And he's not a big nine year old. He's just like a normal little nine year old. And so like uh you know we just did a hundred meat chickens. So man, like dragging those uh, chicken tractors across the pasture, and they, bro, I processed all of them on the ranch wow. myself. 
You know, like like my fam, my kids and my wife help with like ten of them because they wanted to do it and have the experience. And they're like, "Okay, Dad, have fun, <laughs> have fun, right? <laughs> Go do the rest, dude." Now, that you've... was rough. It was a lot it, of work. You've processed uh, some cattle as well, haven't you? Yes, we did one cow yeah. on, on on the ranch, but that was I hired a mobile butcher because okay. dude, dude, processing a, like a cow is like a twelve hundred pound animal. That is an yeah. industrial process. You don't do that, like you know, just sharpen your little knife and hoist it. Like that's that's huge. What I do do myself though here is uh, I do all of our sheep myself. Like I do them, and then I also hunt. It's Texas, right? So like, and I'm on a hunting lease out in Lano, which is about an hour from here, a big one. And or my buddy is, and he invites me all the time. And we go out all the time, and uh, like I think we got 24 deer last year. And so like I've actually gotten to be like pretty good at processing small deer and, and sheep are considered small game like 100 to 150 pounds that's you know whereas a cow a cow's 1200 pounds yeah. it's a whole different thing different yeah. different animal different world so let's talk about life before this because you in your earlier years were an author mm -hmm. you wrote some books and yep. then uh, and, and some bestsellers some huge books and you yep. eventually transitioned into building a company called book in a box uh, scribe. I believe is, uh, scribe. that that then transformed into scribe right, right? Mm -hmm. yeah um and so i'd love to hear some of that earlier story i mean so let's see i started writing when i was about 27 and like honestly i just took the emails i sent my friends about the dumb stupid drunken things i would do and uh put them on the internet and they blew up and i just kind of carried that ball and ran with it and um it ended up doing pretty well and right my books my my the iconic book that i wrote that everyone knows about or most people know about is called i hope they serve beer in hell that spent like five or six years on the new york times bestseller list and sold millions of copies and then the follow-ups did pretty well and then like you know eventually i got you get tired of being a dumb drunk guy in your 20s right even it, like for me it carried into my 30s because it was my job but then eventually i'm just like Ugh, enough of this and so i kind of retired from from writing about that just because I wasn't doing it anymore and I didn't want to. And so then, you know, like when you write a book, you know, you've written a book. The, the question uh, you get all the time is um, how do, well, how do you, how did you do it? Cause everyone wants to write their own books. So they, then they ask if they haven't, they ask you how you did it. And so That's right. I, I just had tons of people asking me how and, and uh, uh, then started helping people do it. And then it turned into scribe. And then that company did 2,000 plus books. Um, we did David Goggins and Dan Sullivan and Tiffany Haddish and a bunch of other huge people. I sold out um, in 2021 uh, and left and then came out here. Um, and like now uh, my, <laughs> my, dude, my day is like, uh, you know, cleaning up chicken shit. <laughs> oh, dude, like I actually did that today too. I had to go get the eggs. You know, we had fifteen eggs, and they got chicken poop all over them. And it's like, I gotta wash the eggs now. You know, it's a big difference. Uh, you know, but <laughs> but you know, the the reality is, in your business, you gotta clean up some chicken poop as well. You know, and, but only and metaphorical, it bro. Different, yeah, that's, right. that's actually that's the funny right. thing. Is it harder to deal with real chicken crap or yes. or, or metaphorical? I was I think yeah. metaphorical is actually okay. harder. It's it's it smells better. Like like real chicken poop it definitely smells worse. But like you could just chickens are so easy to deal with and they're so predictable. And then yeah, poop's annoying but then you just wash it off and you're done with it. <laughs> it's like chickens don't sue you. Chickens don't <laughs> file complaints. They don't uh write terrible things on Glassdoor or whatever. Like they just uh poop on their eggs and then that's it. So let's talk about some of the highs and lows of, of you know, really starting Scribe and, and having this company yeah. scale into the monstrosity that it became because that, you know, it started with just one book. And I think you, you I believe, enjoyed writing, right, for, for at least that season. Like that was like Yeah, I liked writing my own stuff. I yeah. liked writing my own stuff. Uh, I, I didn't really like doing writing stuff for other people, which it was right. a blessing because what it did is it forced us very early on. It would have been easy for me to, to start like kind of a ghostwriting boutique firm that was like mainly me and a couple of other people, which maybe in certain ways would have been uh, better. Cause like, like 
It depends. Uh, when you're doing so, so Scribe basically help people write and publish and market their books, right? So it's a high end. Uh, you know, it's pretty expensive. It's anywhere from right now, they charge like uh, forty five to one hundred and fifty grand or something. So, so uh, it's a, a pretty expensive. It's a high touch, high end uh, service company, right? And so, like an a, an agency, and so it's not great margins. You know, it's. 15 to 25 ish percent, right? Depending on various factors. And so like the question for an agency like that is, do you keep it small and highly profitable and boutique or do you scale it? Right? Yep. Cause you can't really be in that middle. Like if you're in the five to 10 or the 10 million range for a company like scribe, you get crushed because that's where you're, you're below, let's call it below, like in the, in the four to eight million range, for sure, um, you, you're not big enough that you need much process. You, you can have very low overhead, relatively low process. You can run that company with le- 20 or less people, um, not including freelancers. And so, like, you can have a you, you can essentially keep the whole company in your head, you know, and um, and, and you can do a lot of the work yourself, you know, it's it, it's it. it and you can you can actually probably have thirty percent margins on a, on a business like that, maybe even forty, depending on how much you do yourself, et cetera. And so it's never going to get big, but like let's say you're making five million a year and you're taking home a million a year or a million and a half, that's pretty solid, right? Uh, totally. Maybe even two if you're lucky in good years. That's pretty good. That's that's a, that's a solid living. Um, but Zach and I, and then eventually we hired a CEO, Javon. Um, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to scale it, right? And so, yeah. man, scaling was the worst. Like scaling a high-touch customer service company uh, with the deals with high-end people, people like you who are very successful and have a lot of money, is really hard, dude. It's really hard. Now, the, the good thing was, bro, I got a, a multi-year <laughs> master class in the psychology of, of sales. Psychology of sales is easy. The psychology of customer service is extremely Ooh. understudied. And we really went deep and I got very good at that because you have to like, especially when you're doing books, which are uh, like very identity driven and very emotional. If you don't really nail that with people, they get very upset. And so much of what they're buying is not what they say they're buying, right? Like if you buy concrete, you don't have any emotion around concrete. Like that's just a transactional sale. You're buying a, a, and even some services are transactional. Um, you know, like massage to some extent, like there's not a big emotional element. It's like, are they a good masseuse or not? You know, there's some customer right. service stuff, but for the most part, it's a functional thing. What we're doing is so much about the, the deep emotional experience that the author brings in understanding that. And most of the time they don't even know a lot of times, uh, what that is ahead of time and what that's going to be. And so learning all of that and figuring out a process that works at scale with that was so hard, Justin. And like, I understand why no one had really built a big company in this space before because the amount of intelligence and ability and effort you have to put in, we built what ended up being about a 50 to $60 million company. Bro, if I'd put that same amount of effort into software, it would have been a $500 million company. Right. And so like, it was like, it was one of those things where it was like, man, I I learned so much and this was amazing. But (laughs) but dude, like, I'm not getting paid what I like, what, what my ability and my effort in in most sectors of this economy would output um, if I'd been in finance or software or even engineering or at this point, like uh, 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 manufacturing, like there's so many, and it was a little frustrating, man. Um, but like, it's like one of those things where it's like, all right, whatever, that's that's my journey. Like, I, yeah, I have a nice ranch here. I, I don't have a G4, but I have a beautiful ranch and great kids. And so like, I'm not that upset by it. And so that, that experience was pretty good. Um, uh, and the exit experience with getting out was great. Um, the problem came after like what, like when the, the people who bought it from us and and took over destroyed it and that sucked. And that was very unfun to see, but like that just happens with, with companies sometimes, you know, like when it's out of your control, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. And you underestimate, you know, when you're acquiring a business, I think most people underestimate 
the importance of the people running it, the original founders or some of the key people. And, and those that don't, they recognize that they want to put some sort of an earn out in place so that you have to stick around for a year or two or four. Yeah. And in your instance, though, you really got to walk away immediately, right? Or pretty well, close to that? Well, I did. I was sort of. So so I kind of half got out in, in, in 20, December of 21. And then, like, I, I, I for the next year, I helped them run the coaching program because, like, like, I was still kind of like I would leave the workshops and stuff. And then um, uh, that was twenty two. That was the twenty twenty two December twenty twenty two. I basically sold all my equity. Although I think we signed January of twenty three, but like, um, so I was fully out. Like I owned nothing. I had no role in the company. I did nothing. Right. Um, so it it was it was it was a little bit that wasn't technically an earnout, but it kind of operated that way. The problem for me, and this is a whole different discussion. I don't know if you want to get into was. Uh, w- the buyout was over two years, right? And so, like, I didn't get all of my money before the company essentially went. Not essentially, I think it actually did go bankrupt. Um, it did. The bank put it in receivership, and there's someone who bought it now, and they're they're trying to turn it around, like a whole different entity. And I think they're doing a pretty solid job. We'll see what happens. But like, I'm I'm not going to end up getting all of the money that that the, all of the buy price you know like yeah. like i'm one of those pro football players who signed like a hundred million dollar deal but then gets cut before it, it like comes out so it's like how much did you actually get because you didn't get the full thing like like my deal wasn't guaranteed you know yeah yeah <laughs> um, so but, but that happens when you, man when you did have an exit though uh i would assume just based on what i know that you had a pretty good multiple right the acquiring company uh they were pretty aggressive in in purchasing this yeah I, right. yeah we we had a good valuation um i mean dude the, the year that zach and i left they did we did 21 million top line wow. you know and That's so like yeah incredible. like in that sort of business was amazing and so um we, we got we got a decent buy price um uh uh but I mean that, like I said, like a, uh, uh, and it's like an unguaranteed contract in football. You know, if the company doesn't survive and they don't pay, doesn't matter, right? So it's, it's so, sort of same thing. So how did they structure it? You don't have to give exact amounts, but percentage wise, did they give you? You know, was this like half now, half later? Was no, this, it was you know, way worse deal than that. You got okay. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's see, I got uh, like ten or fifteen percent up front. Okay. And then the rest was in four installments over two years. Um, okay. Yeah. So it, it was not horrible, but the company had to survive, right? That's and right. so the old CEO who who kind of took over with the new PE guys, they did really kind of a breathtaking job driving it into bankruptcy that quickly. Um, there's probably some embezzlement that went on. There's like there's a there's a ton of lawsuits going on right now between that crew and almost. Sur- I would bet there's going to be some criminal stuff at least uh, pursued. I don't know if it's going to go anywhere or not because I'm I'm not sure. I don't know the details that much. It was one of those things, man, where it was like I had to decide: was I going to make the next two or three or four years of my life trying to get justice out of this, or was I just going to let it go? and move on right and and that was like a deep decision for me i decided i was just gonna let it go um uh zach my co-founder is spending a little bit more time in it and 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 then and the the other the people who bought it are suing the ceo or and all this they're all they're enmeshed they're like going they're going after each other um that sounds but i like thankfully i'm not involved in that man i'm not i'm not named in any lawsuits i'm not suing anybody like I, I didn't wrong anyone and the people that wronged me, um, f- I, I felt it was w- far more worth it for me to forgive them, uh, uh, emotionally and let go of that and move on than it was to, to, to engage in that fight. You know, there's some fights are definitely worth it, but like, what was I going to get Two, three million, four million, five million, six million, like at best. Yeah. You know, it's just like, that's not worth the, it wasn't worth the aggravation for me. Thankfully, I'm in a financial place and I have enough success where I didn't have to do that. I'm in a place where, I mean, it sucks. Like, it's like, I'm, it's, it's not a fun thing, but I can, I'm able to make that choice and I'm able to decide, you know what? I'm going to focus on my family and I can make more money later. I'm still a young dude. I've got a ton of opportunity. 
So I was I was lucky enough to able to, to let that go, to make that choice. Well, I think that's a, a brilliant way of doing it uh, if you have the ability to do that because it casts this huge mental cloud that's just horrible. If you've been involved in any lawsuits, um, it's, it is just the worst. So if you can avoid it in any way, shape or form, and by the way, I've also done the same thing where I've just walked away, where people have owed me money, uh, but in some instances, it just makes sense to walk away and, yeah. and save that mental space, not have to drain you know that the, the mental bank account every day thinking about it right um because it is taxing it is it is i've been in lawsuits i've had i've had fights i mean major ones um for some for my freedom um not criminal but more civil stuff but it was still like it was it felt like a uh, felt like it wasn't but it felt like a fight for my wife and it was like those are ones i kind of couldn't avoid um uh or it was like, is like, okay, am I am I going to stand up for myself here or not? This was one where I like I I had the opportunity and I had enough money that I had the ability to to choose to let this go, right? And I felt like, yeah, I'm with you, man. It was it was not. I'm sure there's a number at which I would not have, right? Yeah. But um um, it wasn't it wasn't the number that was on the table, so. Well, on the flip side, your exit timing was impeccable and you got a great multiple. And so you have a lot of things, you know, in your favor on that. And, uh, and it is nice just to kind of wash your hands of something and move on. You know, it is nice totally to be in a position. Done. I can make that choice. I yeah. really like that is definitely one of those, like, I, I, it's weird to lose millions of dollars and feel like it was a blessing. Uh, one that I'm in, a, I, I'm blessed enough that I can, that can happen and I'm still okay. Right. And like to, to totally. be like so appreciative and grateful of that, man, I'm in such a good spot that this, this is still a body blow, man. It's not like, it, this is not a rounding error in my net worth. This is a part, this is a big part of it. Right. But like, That's right. I, I can survive it. And, and and then also, man, I did, I learned so many lessons from this. I think big ones and important ones, um, I would like to have learned those lessons. Uh, I would like to have paid a lot less to learn <laughs> lessons, but but I didn't. It wasn't a crippling amount, you know. It's not like yeah. you know I had to sell everything I own and we had to move to whatever some crappy apartment in some horrible city. I didn't. I mean, like it, it was all things considered, man. Um, I came out of this. I came out of a really bad situation, really good, you know. Yeah. I agree. I think you handled it it well, and you handled it with class, and and you're even open to talk about it. You're an open book, so to say, about everything, and I love that about you. Uh, I'm curious, though. You now have probably more cash that you're sitting on or that you have at your disposal than you've ever had in your life. Um, we're in a weird economic time. Yeah. Uh, this the, the past few years have been nutty. Uh, the coming, you know, few years, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious your thoughts on like what you're doing. And we've talked about this a little bit, but yeah. I, I mean, this is a fun conversation. Like, <laughs> what do you invest in now? When yeah. So I have a so very uncertain? different, I have a very different perspective on this than most people. Right. And yes. so I'm, I'm not going to try and convince you this is the right perspective. I'm just going to tell you what I'm doing. Okay. And that's it. Right. Like, um, so and if I had like way more money, I probably would uh, uh, be, I wouldn't make fundamentally different decisions. I make a lot, a lot of other decisions, right? Um, but like what almost all of my focus right now and for the immediate future, meaning at least the next two years, is um, I invest in hard productive assets only. So let me be like super clear what that means. Um, so like land, right? And and like very specifically, I don't mean like in a real estate sense, like I'm going to buy some raw land and develop it. Or I mean, that's cool. That That's a great business. It's not a business I know or I've ever been involved in. When I say a productive land, I mean this 45 acres that I live on right now, we have um, uh, 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 our own water supply. We have two. We have owned water, meaning like we have uh, a well and then we also have a rain, a massive rainwater collection system that would last us a year and a half if it didn't rain. <laughs> it hasn't rained for two and a half months or whatever. Here. But like we're we're testing our system and it's doing great. So like I have my own water, 
Uh, we have our own food. Like, like uh, we have enough sheep and chickens now. We're essentially self-replicating. Like, um, uh, we, uh, we have cows. We don't have a bull. We don't have a cow-calf operation. But, like, um, uh, uh, we, we have essentially all the food we could ever eat, right? And we can grow. I'm not, uh, we're not that great at growing stuff yet, but good enough, right? So we're, we're water independent. We're food independent. Um, we're basically energy independent. I and mean, we are on the grid, of course. There's no such thing as off grid. People who think they're off grid, I'm like, bro, what do you do when you have three power couplers break? And they're like, what? I'm like, right, you're on China's grid. Like you're on a grid. You just don't realize it. You're on a different, you're on a manufacturing grid. So we're on, uh, you know, pet analysis co-op, which is uh, pretty solid. Uh, and then we have, uh, pro, you know, generators, buried propane tanks that we have months of that. And then we have a good backup solar system that can run all the essentials essentially indefinitely. Right. And so like, um, like regardless of what happens in terms of supply chain breakdowns, in terms of societal upheaval or whatever, we're really, really well put together here and not just like oh i've got a bunch of dry food like no 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 dry food's fantastic but that runs out like she as long as like we have our sheep aren't gonna run out you know right. like literally as long as the grass keeps growing then we're good for meat right and then also all the accoutrements that you need to run a really effective homestead you know the, there's a lot of implements both, you know, power tools, which are uh, super nice, but then also the non-power backups, right? Like, it's really great to have a skid steer, but then also you need a shovel, right? Yeah. In case the skid steer doesn't, isn't working or whatever, you have fuel issues. So when I say productive hard assets, I mean first survival productive hard assets. Now, on top of that, like the, the next layer of investments for me are things like how do I... And I have not gone deep into this yet. I have not started a lot, but I'm looking at at what are the businesses that I think are going to be easy to set up and do really well in a very chaotic world. Um, and I, I like food production is going to become extremely local for at least a, people who have money and ability are going are already doing it. But um, I think it's going to accelerate rapidly, right? Like, like all, almost all things is going to bifurcate, right? Like the 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 soy jacks who live in the pods and eat the bugs are going to be as centralized with it. Like they're just going to be eating factory goo, right? M those of us who figure it out, like like you did, and and the L rods and everyone else are going to buy some land and raise some of their own food and then get as much as they can from their neighbors, right? Or from people within like that they know. That's and right. so thinking about like, I mean, I, when I mean, and I mean very literally, uh, 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 butchers, uh, meat processors, um, things like that, those businesses are either pretty easy to buy right now um, or pretty easy to start. Um, and they, most of the people running them are either old or, or decades behind in terms of just basic modern business processes, which in certain ways is good, right? But right. in other ways, right. th there's there's a lot of improvements that could be made without becoming too stupidly spreadsheet brain, right? Like, um, and so, uh, uh, like, I've been looking at those very, very closely um, and trying to figure out where can I bring, what do I need to learn and where can I bring expertise into those areas? Um, that is actually where almost all of my money is because I think we're reaching a point where, it, I mean, it, it might take five years, six years, but, um, I, I, I'm concerned there's going to be at least a few incidents and they may not be long term, but where like, if you can't get it within 10 or 20 miles, you're not getting it. Right. And so like, what does a world look like that, that maybe isn't like that forever? But, um, uh, you know, what happens when the international supply, we've already seen it, like we've already seen it not yeah. really break, Round but one. We, we've seen it, we've seen major problems and I don't think it's going to get better, man. Like there's a, I don't, I, like the world's not going to collapse. We're not going to have anarchy and, you know, like uh, you know, walking dead, nothing like that. But like, I, I think so much of what we take for granted in the modern world a lot of it is going to fundamentally change and a lot of the high energy inputs are going to have to be sourced locally. And I, uh, and so almost all of the way I'm thinking and the money I'm saving is going to be spent and invested in 
how do you how do you capitalize on that right and first of all how do you make it possible because it's not even about like bro, there's no world where i don't think there's any world where uh, uh building a meat processor is going to be the highest financial return i can get <laughs> like, I right. maybe it's possible but for someone like me or you who's like very smart and, and able to access almost any capital market and any investment like but building a meat processor is never going to be the the highest profit thing but it it, it it's definitely it, it financial profit but yeah. i think um i'm starting to look around at what are the other measures of return that i want to um to put in my calculations but beside just you know K- capex or whatever yeah. you know well well you buy it right and you're likely not going to lose money you should be able to cash flow something and yes. you get the utility out of it because you're going to use it anyway and if you're going to use it then for sure there are other people in the community that are going to use it so it makes tons of sense and yep this gets back to, you know, I've been talking about this forever, but just mom and pop businesses, mom and pop real estate, mom and yes. pop, you know, who are the baby boomers? What are they selling that has value that they yes. don't even recognize has value that they're just going to shut down because their kids don't want it. So yep. they're, it's literally just going to go goodbye unless someone comes in to buy it. And there are tons of these small businesses out there, tons of them. So I love I, it. I mean, dude, and and but he, most people are looking for those. I, I totally agree with you, but they're looking for those opportunities in cities. Right. And there's plenty in cities. Like nothing against that. I just, in my opinion, most cities, and I mean major cities, right? Um, most cities are already becoming very dangerous. I think they're going to get way more dangerous. Um, like like 1970s day. Most people aren't old enough to. I'm barely old enough to remember how dangerous like New York city was in the seventies, right? Like, like the old people remember the boomers remember. I, I think most, uh, major cities are going to get like that. Not all, but most. And, and, uh, to me, the opportunities, um, uh, huge opportunities are, are rural, you know, and not, maybe not like, you know, uh, I don't mean like getting off the grid and living off the land. I mean, like, Finding a town like Dripping is, you know, 5,000 people or finding towns of the, the although Dripping is a little bit in the orbit of Austin. So it's not like, uh, uh, like, you know, you go to Fredericksburg, it's 15, 20,000 people and like it's its own town. Right? right. And there's a ton of opportunity there to bring like um, a lot of uh, more sophisticated um, uh, sort of uh, uh, business practices. Right. But not Certainly. like. But again, the problem is not like when people hear that a lot of times they think like private equity, like, oh, we can we can optimize here and hit. No, 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 no. Stop. <laughs> Stop spreadsheet braining. Right. How do you do it? That's when I say like, like not nice. Not, like if I were to build a meat processor. Right. Like it. I understand why Smithfield became evil. Like why? Why the meat processing business? Do you know the story? Like, how, there's only four major no. meat processors, right? Dude, the story's crazy, man. There's only four major meat processors right now. Let me, I'll, I'll tell you, this is a, this is a really example of how evil that bi- business, I mean, you've seen all the videos, the industrial farming system and the yep. industrial meat system and how horrible it is. And how, like, if, if my, if that, if all meat came from the industrial meat system, I would probably be vegan. Like, I understand why someone would watch one of those videos and be vegan. That's not the only option for meat. Like, you can come out to my ranch and you can meet your sheep and you can actually dispatch it. You can kill it. You can skin it. You can treat it with all the reverence in the world. Like, that's a fundamentally different way to, to deal with, with meat. But, like, Long, long story short, Smithfield built this huge pork production facility. Like, I mean, like a like a multi-story factory, hundreds of thousands of square feet, and the price like of pork in North Carolina went from something like uh, sixty cents a pound to two cents a pound. They drove all the independent pork producers out of business, and then essentially set up a fiefdom for for, for pork producers. Like, if you were going to wow. raise pork to sit, like it was a ho- dude. It's so horrible, and so of course they have to feed them literal garbage, and it's the way. And it makes sense because if you're looking at meat, it makes sense from a spreadsheet brain. If you're looking at it as dollars only, everything Smithfield does makes sense. But uh, 
that's not the only way to evaluate business, right? And it, there, there are other things that matter. Money matters, but so does health. So does you know health and nutrition. So does um, uh, the aesthetics. So does the humanity of it. So does your connection to it. All that sort of stuff, especially with food. Like the touchy feely stuff with food is often very, very backed up by science, right? And yep. so like 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 the, the 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 lambs that come off of my ranch. Are you can you can do the tests on the meat and see how how much healthier, how many more minerals, how much more nutrition you get out of those lamps. Like, um, and, and so like running those old businesses very efficiently in a modern way, but instead of spreadsheet braining, braining them, thinking like a human. You know, like how do we run a meat processor that is very efficient, but at the same time understands like. Uh, you know, uh, why grass fed is important, why you know, high mineral count is important, why uh, 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 killing the animals in a humane, stress free way is important, all like why, you know, knowing the farmer is important, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you got to be able to tell that story to consumers and they got to be able to pay for that, right? Like, if you right. want, if I want a, 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 a pork that was treated humanely and then lived a great life i don't get to pay smithfield prices <laughs> like that's just not how it works if i want pork for a dollar a pound i gotta i gotta buy from smithfield if i want it for four dollars a pound i can buy from all right uh, i can buy from acorn farms in iowa that, that like, like basically treat their pigs like kings but i gotta pay five dollars a pound that's right and, and they gotta tell those story right and so th when i say what have i been investing in that those are the business i've been looking at and the world i've been looking at and thinking how do i bring all of the sophistication to that world without in it, but we keep all of the heart and the meaning and the importance of it. Does that make sense? Totally. Totally. And and when you think also about other businesses that could be good and we could talk about like a canning facility or we could talk about, you know, ammo facility or, you know, like there's tons of these different businesses that, that mm -hmm. could make a lot of sense. Uh, but one that I think is near and dear to you is your wife Veronica's business in yeah, healthcare, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. let's talk ultra personal healthcare for a second because uh, this is going to become more and more prevalent. This this way of doing it, but even just kind of the the pivot that's happening. Uh, we saw it in, in COVID where telemedicine started becoming more of a thing and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and health in general started becoming more commoditized and more, uh, you know, like a monthly subscription kind of like yep. SaaS type of yep. or, or MMR type of, of platform. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, all right. So my, my wife's a nurse practitioner. And so it's funny because like she, she like you know, graduated from Stanford with like a 397 in biochemistry, right? So like she easily could have gone to med school, but she wanted a family. And like, if you want to be a doctor as a woman, not as a dude, it's a little different, but as a woman, if you want to be a doctor and, and have a bunch of kids, it's, it's not impossible. It is really hard, right? Cause you're like not yep. finishing med school and residency until you're in your thirties. Right. And then it's like, you know, you can't really have kids as a re you can, but having kids as a resident, you're not going to be a good mom. And so she's like, okay, how can I basically be a doctor, but not have to go through all that school and residency and all the horrible stuff? She's like, oh, nurse practitioner. A nurse practitioner is essentially like a high level nurse. They can write prescriptions. They can do basically everything a doctor can do. And so she decided to do that. And so she was, you know, out practicing by 24 five or something 26 instead of 35 or 36 and then um uh she realized like most people who deal with the medical system how screwed up it was oh. and how how anti-human it is and how horrible insurance is and all the incentives are screwed up and like like it's funny we've had our first kid um she, when she was pregnant she was like uh, she was like, want to do home births. And that was before I knew anything about this stuff. And I'm like, that sounds, those are weirdos. Like those are weird <laughs> hippies who live in the woods. Why would you do a home birth? And she goes, I've worked in hospitals. I will not go into a hospital unless my option is go there or die. <laughs> and she's like, wow. we're going to explore home birth because we've been doing, people have been doing home births for thousands of years and they're really great. Turns out they're amazing. All four of our kids were home births. Uh, midwives are like, uh, like, uh, saints on earth. I think now, now that I've been there and experienced it. But like, anyway, so, so she's like, how can I kind of like what I was talking about with, you know, with, with, um, brick and mortar 
you know, physical productive asset businesses. And she's like, how can I make healthcare something that's, that, that's amazing that actually is good. And she came upon uh, like a uh, 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 primary care, like subscription primary care where like you pay a monthly fee and then that way you don't have to pay for appointments. Like you're just paying whatever, a hundred something dollars a month and you can text your provider. You can call them. You can zoom them. You can go in anytime you want with any question. Everything's covered. Right. So like, uh, uh, and, and that way it's in like, you know, you take hour long appointments with your patients. You, you have one provider and they like know your history every time you come in. So you don't have to like talk to a new person, have these weird conversations. They help you like on long term goals. And it's not just about sick care. It's like, cause she wanted, like, I don't want to just treat people who are sick and they have a lifestyle that makes them continually sick and they don't like change that. I want to help people become healthy and yeah. becoming healthy is about how you eat, how you sleep, how much time you spend outside, how much exercise you have, your mental health, your relationships. It's that whole th package. And so like she started her direct primary care and like, now she's got, you know, hundreds or uh, hundreds of thousands of patients, whatever it is. And it's like, they all love her. And she, because and every day she gets up and she gets to like, like treat people the way she wants to, to treat them and the way they want to be treated the way she would want to be treated as a patient, right? Which is like human to human connection, human to human interaction. She actually cares about them. She, she can show them, they can, she can spend time with each of them, help them work through all their problems and then help them prevent getting like sick. You know, instead of like, Oh, when you get sick, come in, I'll give you a pill. It's like, how do we stop you from getting sick? And then how do we help you feel the best possible way? Right? I mean, it's like, it seems so obvious when you say it, does. When you say it, it totally right? Does. But like, it's one of those things that like most people, you, you know, you're brought up in the, the, the doctor centered insurance centered universe, which is so screwed up and so anti-human. Yeah. Like, cause like, and it, I, I understand why the healthcare system's so screwed up because like, if it's insurance based, they only get paid for what they can code and prevention. There's no code for prevention, right? There's only code for treat treating an right. illness. That's right. It's horrible. Like it's yeah, a horrible it's, system. It's backwards. Yes. Uh, the incentives are totally misaligned. Yes. And we just had this crazy experience with, uh, with my wife's dad where, he was not even treated. I mean, just you had said inhumane. I mean, it, it goes so many levels beyond just inhumane. It was mind boggling to us. And yeah. we had never seen that side of it before. So I'm excited about what Veronica's doing. We're, we're clients. We're, uh, and by the way, she was a, a game changer for me because I got this crazy ear infection on my way home from Portugal. So this flight, I'm you know in altitude. My ear feels like it's about to like blow up. Yeah. Uh, I land. I reach out to her, and uh, she gets everything you know resolved real quick because I got another trip coming up uh, on Lake Powell, living on like a houseboat yacht thing right. on Lake Powell. So I'm going to be in water again. So. Uh, she totally solved my issue really fast. And no, but uh, think about that for a second, great. dude. Think like it's obvious. This is how healthcare should work. You have a problem, you reach out directly, text, phone, whatever. You yep. get an answer right away. They right. send in the script if, if it, you know, like whatever. The, I'm sure you got some medicine or something. So send in the script right. You get it like that day or the next day. Whereas like if you had most doctors, like you'd be super lucky to get an appointment within a week. That's It'd right. probably take two or three weeks. Then you go in, they would do the same thing she can do over Zoom or whatever, text or whatever, right. and like uh, uh, be obnoxious about it. Probably you get 15, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. If it's a bigger problem, like, well, we got to do this. And if it doesn't work, you got to schedule another appointment. It's a horrible system. It <laughs> horrible. Totally is. Right. It's, it's built for insurance. It's not built for the patients. Yeah. And well, that's what happens when insurance is paying and the patient isn't. So that's the big difference is because you are paying Veronica directly. She has to make sure she does a really good job serving you, not that's serving right. Humana. That's right. Like, that's right. And this is just so basic. I uh, love it. Well, it's a brilliant model and uh, I'm so glad she's doing it. So glad that you've got the, the time and space to be able to uh, give her the ability to do this. And what a fun time. What a, what a great conversation uh, that we got a chance to share here. I just thank you for uh, 
um, really just saying things as they are. I appreciate that about you. My pleasure, man. My pleasure. And I'm, I'm going to have quite a few uh, lamb to sell if you're looking to buy. <laughs> We've got good. like 30 pregnant ewes. So in the fall, if you want some lamb, man. I love uh, it. Oh, and if you if you want to bring your wife and daughter out, you got you don't have to. But like literally, you can come out here. You guys can kill it, or I'll kill it in front of you. You guys can help skin it, like like process it. We can do it, like, or you can just pay for it. Either way, I love it. Right? I, like, I, I think the whole process is amazing. I, I think that'd be a very educational way of doing it. So that's awesome. Yep. And I've seen the videos with you and your kids. And I, hey, I just think it's amazing. This, this total life transition that you've been able to do and, and, and do so successfully and, and with such great joy. And then you share it with your community. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah it's, not, it's not bad. I like it. Well, cool. Well, if anyone wants to learn more about you, where should they go? Uh, just go to the website, tuckermax.com, or I'm on all like social, like my social media is just pictures of my kids or pictures of the homestead. That's it. Like, it's not, it. it's not that interesting. And in, unless you're like in your, if you're on homestead Instagram, then I like, it's interesting. Otherwise that's all it is. I love it. Well, I'm going to wrap up today the way I wrap up every episode. And that's with a question for our audience. What is one step you can take today towards financial freedom and living the life that you desire on your terms, not by default, but by design? And uh, Tucker's doing a great job of that. He's living life on his terms. He's created a plan. He's been able to execute that plan. So what can you take from this episode to move towards that in your life? Thanks, and we'll catch you next week.